You're listening to an audio resource from Redemption Hill Church. This resource is not meant to be a replacement for participation at a local church, but an accessory to the care you're receiving from your own pastors. To learn more about Redemption Hill Church or to give to our ministry, visit redemptionhilldsm.org. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all the, uh, these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia... Uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one, one another, what does this mean? But others mocked and said, they are filled with new wine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Great. You may be seated. Uh, we do have some activities in the hallway for kids. We have a restless kids room, as you know. Totes are in there as well. So uh, something for Pentecost in particular, um, just across the hallway. Uh, as you all know, I'm a, I'm a lover of church history. I've said that before. I'm not, it's not like breaking news, you know. I'm the type of guy who um, has in the past read church history books for fun. And for years, I've, I've taken uh, the opposite view or opposite approach to history from, I don't know, many other pastors, just my peers. While churches and church leaders um, disconnect from history or, or just don't think about their connection to history, um, they celebrate, you know, maybe Easter and Christmas I've actually taken the opposite view. It's like, I'm looking for more contours into history. In my opinion, um, I think it's arrogant to think or functionally behave independently from history, as if you're just by yourself, with no mind toward what has happened prior. Redemption Hill is not the new, best new thing since sliced bread. We're not. We have yet to come up with anything new, inventive, or unique. I'm very comfortable with that. Instead, we stand on the shoulder of giants. We praise God for our brothers and sisters who have gone before us and who have labored near and far to share the gospel in homes, in communities, and across the world. I thank God for the men who gathered and created the Nicene Creed of 325 A.D. I praise God for the Apostles' Creed and those who wrote the Apostles' Creed of the 2nd century. I praise God for those who did the hard work to write the Heidelberg Confession, the Westminster Confession, or the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is what our Confession of Faith is built off of. That's all in the past. That's history. We are not independent from history, but we are deeply connected. In addition to creeds and our confession of faith, another way to express how we are connected to history is by taking a moment to highlight specific historical events. It is healthy for a church to occasionally pause and remember the milestones of our history. I was just thinking about this. Like when you read the Old Testament, when there was like a milestone, a, an altar of stones was made to commemorate. 
So they wouldn't forget. So when they go back to that particular place, they would remember what God did. Knowing how we got here is just as crucial as being here. Of course, Easter and Christmas are in the Christian calendar. Every year you hear a Christmas and Easter sermon from me. Every year. But there are other important Christian holidays. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, we were driving here. Sharice had read like a meme or a text that she saw on social media. And it said, for all you Baptists, if you grew up in a Baptist tradition, this will make sense. Remember, it's Pentecost Sunday. Because <laughs> Baptists in particular were notorious for not even knowing what that meant. And I'm like, let's lean, actually lean into that a little bit. Let's say, uh, this is actually important. And it's so, you, so you know... Next year, I plan on to inserting ascension, the ascension of Christ, as a part of a regular rhythm of our preaching calendar so that we can remember all that Christ has done. So what I'm doing today is taking a few more ropes and tossing them back into church history, our history, to help us anchor the gospel mission in this church. We need to know the milestones behind us because they testify to the faithfulness of God. Our past emphatically informs our present and our future. So that's why I'm preaching on Pentecost, on Pentecost Sunday. So I'm briefly pray, and then we're going to get into the text. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is authoritative and instructive for us this morning. So we come underneath your word, instruct our minds and our hearts, knowing that the Holy Spirit is indeed at work in all of your disciples. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. While I was writing this sermon, uh, I I was listening to a song by Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Some of you are a big fan. Um, I don't know what that says about me, but I like them. And uh, there's a lyric in this song, and it goes like this, waiting is the hardest part. Waiting is the hardest part. And so here I am, writing this sermon on the Pentecost, and I hear this lyric, I'm like, whoa, there's some contours here. There's, there's, there's There's something going on here. Why is waiting so hard? The lyric is generally true at face value, and when you take this out of context, waiting for something that is going to happen can be hard. So for example, let's say you're engaged, right? Remember, remember the moment you got engaged and you had a wedding date and it's like, I have to wait this many days to get married? Are you kidding me? Like waiting was just, it's so hard in that context, in that setting. You have so many hopes and dreams and they're within your reach, but you just can't quite grasp it. In Acts 1 and chapter 2, chapters 1 and 2, we read that the disciples were told to wait. After the ascension of Jesus, now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, after the ascension of Jesus, I imagine waiting would have been hard. Let's see how we got here. After the resurrection of Christ and before his ascension, Jesus told his disciples, hey, I need you to hang out in Jerusalem. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, he told his disciples, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Since the Lord's ascension, Acts 1, verse 9, ten days had passed. So for 10 days, at least 120 people, including the apostles, have been hanging out, casting lots, playing euchre, perhaps creating a mission strategy. I don't know. Who knows? Whatever they were doing, I think they were playing euchre, personally. But whatever they were doing, they had to wait. And out of obedience to their Lord, they did wait. And why would they not wait? Jesus was nailed on a cross and then rose from the dead. If that is not enough reason to wait, then I don't know what is. Now, there's a a mini application point here for us. I mean, 
we're all really busy in life. I think if we are honest with ourselves, it's hard to wait. It's hard to slow down. We're always going from one thing to the next. We can't wait more than two days for that Amazon package to arrive. Perhaps the lesson for us is if the Lord tells you to wait, you wait. You wait. Could you imagine if one of the disciples was like, nah, I can't wait. I have things to do and people to see. If there was that guy, he missed a lot. So the disciples were told to wait, and then the Jewish holiday of Pentecost finally arrived. The wait was over. Let's talk about Pentecost for a moment. Because you might not know the significance of Pentecost prior to Acts 2. We know Pentecost because of Acts 2, but there's something going on leading up to Acts 2. Pentecost is a Jewish holiday celebrating the harvesting of food. Think about what we, what we see here in Iowa. Right now, farmers are planting seed into the ground. Over the summer, crops will grow. Then at the end of the growing season, farmers go into the field to bring, into the, bring in the corn and the soybeans. The harvest is to be celebrated because of God's provision. Anyone who works in agriculture understands gratitude from the harvest. So the Jews celebrated Pentecost by thanking God for the harvest, giving God the first fruits, the best of the harvest. So like, we got it all in, now this is for God. The best of what we have, that's for God. You know, light bulbs are about to go off for the disciples of, of the Lord. The events we read about in Acts 2 happened on Pentecost, the Jewish holiday Pentecost, for a reason. Here's what Jesus told his disciples during his earthly ministry. I I read it during our corporate prayer. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and, and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he, so he sees this crowd, he sees that they're helpless, they're being harassed, we don't know why, the text doesn't indicate, though our Lord has compassion, and then he pivots to his disciples, and then he says this. He's trying to get them to look at them. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. It is insane. I, since moving rule, I gotta tell you, the agricultural elements of scripture just pop. They're everywhere. And you see it right here. I mean, I hope you see the connection between the Jewish holiday of Pentecost and the somewhat, I guess, redefining of Pentecost by Jesus. There is another kind of harvest that we are to also focus on. Yes, we can still give thanks God for all his provisions. We still want to give back to the Lord 1,000%. Yes and amen. But there's another kind of harvest that Jesus is trying to get our eyes toward. Here are a couple other interesting facts about the Jewish Pentecost. First, it was celebrated 50 days after the Passover during the peak traveling season. Peak traveling season. This means Pentecost in Jerusalem had a cosmopolitan feel because Jews from outside the region could attend the feast. This is interesting when we get dig a little deeper into our text in a few moments. Here's another interesting fact about Pentecost in the first century. In addition to celebrating the harvest, the giving of the Ten Commandments from God to Moses, going back to Exodus, was also celebrated at Pentecost. The recognition of the Ten Commandments was developed later in Jewish history, but was clearly established in the first century. A long story short is that the Jews wanted to remember the time God gave them the law. I find this point fascinating when we consider what God now gives his people at Pentecost in Acts 2. I mean, here's the thought for us to consider. God is constantly giving to his people. 
It is in God's good character to give to His children. So, in God's redemptive plan, where does Pentecost fit? Is Pentecost a footnote in the story? A parenthetical statement, you know, parentheses to the story? Or is Pentecost more significant? Excuse me. To help us understand more about Pentecost, let's go back to the Passover. Again, it's a 50-day lag between the Passover and Pentecost. A lot happened between the Passover, when Jesus celebrated the Lord's Supper with his disciples for the, for the last time, and Pentecost. Two significant events that begin with P. As I said, 50 days had gone by. Listen to all that took place between the Passover and Pentecost. Jesus was betrayed by his friend Judas. Jesus was, was then unjustly condemned to death by the Jews and the Romans. Jesus then endured suffering. Jesus endured carrying up a cross of, on a hill meant for him to be nailed to. But it is on top of this hill where we see the pinnacle of God's redemption. On top of this hill is where Jesus shed his blood to forgive the sins of those who would repent and believe that Jesus is the Son of God. On top of this hill is where Jesus broke his body, enduring the pain and punishment that should have been on you and me. It was on top of this hill where the wrath of God was satisfied. What else happened during these days between the Passover and Pentecost? I'm glad you asked. Because Jesus died He was then taken down from the cross and put into a tomb. Jesus was buried. However, to show the world the power of God, Jesus rose from death, thereby defeating death. Jesus showed that because he is sinless, the devil and death have no claim on his life. But there's more that happened between the Passover and Pentecost. And it is incredible to think that God could do more, but God did more. Many days, for many days after his resurrection, Jesus intensified his teaching and discipleship. So with the holes still in his hands and feet, Jesus went about preparing the apostles and the disciples to take the baton from Jesus. Jesus was calling the apostles to bear witness to the world about the good news. Well, the day came, and Jesus ascended into heaven, and the passing of the baton was almost complete. Almost. Listen to what Luke records in in his gospel. John the Baptist prophesies about the events in Acts 2. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, John the Baptist, whether he might be the Christ. Everyone's wondering, "Is, is John the guy? Is he our Messiah? John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, But he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. (laughs) May we all have that kind of humility. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. In fire. Oh, yeah. I've read Luke 3 many times, and I've thought to myself, maybe you have too, why does John mention fire? What's What's up with that? We read why in Acts 2. John's response is fantastic. He says, nope, I'm not the chosen one. I'm not the Messiah. As a matter of fact, you will know the chosen one because he's going to baptize you. Not not the way that I'm doing it, but something very different. On the 15th day after the ascension of Christ, we read about this promise being fulfilled. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to his people in the form of fire. In light of Luke 3, let's now read Acts 2, verses 2 to 4. Allow your imagination to see what's going on here. I quote, And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them. Utterance. Our friend uh, Charles Spurgeon said this about the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. From the descent of the Holy Spirit at the beginning, we may learn something concerning his operations at the present time. Whatever the Holy Spirit was at first, he is now. I love that. So what we see in what we see in Acts 2 is also now. 
For as God, he remains the same forever. Whatever he did then, is, he is able to do still. For his power is by no means diminished. We would greatly grieve the Holy Spirit if we supposed that this might was less today than in the beginning. While, while the work of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost is certainly unique, the Holy Spirit is the same and still at work. I mean, Pentecost is a milestone. That's why I'm preaching on it. It is unique. But we should not cease to believe that the Spirit is not as powerful and at work today. And that should put us in awe. Let's take a closer look at what's going on. We read about a sound like a mighty mighty rushing wind, verse 2. In my mind, as I'm just trying to imagine this, I picture a mini tornado in this upper room whipping around everything. It is interesting that wind in the Bible often represents the Holy Spirit. Even if we go back to the beginning, Genesis 1 and 2, it is the Spirit of God that was hovering over the faces of the water, over the face of the water. The word spirit in Genesis 1-2 is often translated in the Hebrew as wind. And then we read about fire resting, I assume, on the top of each person's head. Verse 3, the fire symbolized the presence of God. Consider for a moment the times that we read about in Scripture where fire is used to represent God. It's actually a, a, a theme that is woven all throughout Holy Scripture. Exodus 3, Moses goes up to mountain to speak with God, and God spoke with Moses through a bush that was what? On fire. The bush wasn't being consumed, but the fire was there. Exodus 13, God leads Israel through the wilderness in the daytime by a pillar, a cloud, but leads them by night by a pillar of fire to light the way. In Exodus 19, we read that the Lord descended on Mount Sinai like a fire. Deuteronomy 5, we read that the Lord speaks through a fire. And the list goes on. So when you get to Pentecost, it's actually kind of, kind of cool when you can make those, connect those dots. It's like it's not, the, this idea that, that, the, that God would descend like a fire doesn't come out of nowhere. So it's like, oh, never seen that before. Actually, I've seen it a lot, a lot. The power of Pentecost and since Pentecost is that the presence of God is now with his people, which is what the fire represents. In the Old Testament, the presence of God was really with a few select people. You got David and Moses and Abraham, right? We read about these great figures throughout our history. But now with Pentecost... And with Pentecost being such a seminal moment, we see that the presence of God rests on anyone who has faith in Jesus Christ. And we read that this happens through the filling of of the Holy Spirit, verse 4. I mean, if we can hit the pause button for a moment, Pentecost is truly historic. It's truly historic. And beyond the importance of the history of Pentecost, consider the practical implications on your life. God is in you and with you if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. God, God knows you better than you know yourself. If you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, then the power and presence of God resides in you. John, John Stott punctuates the importance of the Holy Spirit with this quote. There can be no life without the life giver, no understanding without the spirit of truth, no fellowship without the unity of the spirit, no Christ-likeness of character apart from his fruit, and no effective witness without his power. It is helpful, I think, for you to see that just as the apostles had the empowering presence of God with them, so does every person who is a follower of Jesus Christ. There's such a temptation to read our Bibles and say, I couldn't couldn't have the faith of Abraham. I couldn't have the courage of Moses. Couldn't have the wisdom of Solomon, at least early on. And the fact of the matter is, the spirit spirit that was with them is with you, Christian. 
Those are the shoulders of giants that we now stand upon. So, through the highs and lows of your life, you tap into the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, let's get real practical for a moment. Have you had a bad week? I've had bad weeks. Well, the Holy Spirit is with you to guide you, to encourage you. Tough day at home with the kids. Love you, kids. God, the Holy Spirit, is with you, Mom and Dad, to help you disciple your kids. Are you facing a major life decision? Then lean into God, the Holy Spirit, to guide you. Do you want to be bold in your evangelism? I know I want to be more bold. I really do. The Holy Spirit can give you boldness and the words to share the gospel. Back to our seed in verses 2 to 4 of Acts 2. What is going on in these verses does challenge our modern sensibilities, and I, and I think for good reason. I mean, when's the last time you saw fire rest upon someone's head? Any takers, right? But I submit to you that this took place just like the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Further, I think Pentecost is a unique historical moment that belongs in the same category as the incarnation, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. I'm going to grant that there is a bit of mystery wrapped up in Pentecost. Our imagination cannot fully grasp the scene, at least, at least not mine, but perhaps that is part of the point of verses 2 to 4. There is beauty when we embrace the mystery and wonder. I also think that the inclusion of wind and fire points to the unique nature of the moment. It is as if God is putting a signpost into the ground to mark the significance. Don't forget. God is saying to you, Christian, go, take the message of Christ to your home, to your workplace, to your school, and to your neighborhood. I think about track and field for a moment. This, this, this picture, this analogy really helped me. Uh, the 4x100, four the 4x400 four meter relays are standard in track and field. The race starts, and the goal is for the first runner to, to hand the baton to the next runner, Right? Pentecost is the moment in redemptive history when Jesus and the church kind of hold the baton together, right? It's that one brief moment where the Lord's hand and the church's hand is on the baton. And then, finally, Jesus lets go of the baton, and then the church begins to run with the baton while empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the king over the church. Yes, make no mistake about it. But the king now entrusts his bride, the church, with the mission to proclaim the gospel near and wide. Beginning in our homes, in our churches, in our communities, and yes, all across the world. Here's a, another helpful quote from John Stott. I had to amend it slightly. The place left vacant by Judas has been filled by Matthias. That's uh, Matthias, excuse me. The place left vacant by Jesus has now been filled by the Spirit. The passing of the baton is not only from Jesus to his disciples, but from the Son of God to God the Holy Spirit. So even though Jesus is not physically with us, his Spirit is with us. We live in the reality that Jesus is alive, and the active work of the Holy Spirit testifies to Christ. This is an, an excellent time to talk about some of the tensions within Christianity regarding the Holy Spirit. Here's what I mean. Some churches and denominations do not give the Holy Spirit the attention He deserves. God the Father receives attention. God the Son receives attention. But the Holy Spirit is like right, regulated to the JV squad. Pentecost is a footnote in the greater story of God's redemption. To treat the Holy Spirit as if He is just a supporting actor in the story is to say that the Holy Spirit's not God. If you do not believe the Holy Spirit is currently at work and active, you have actually a deficient view of God. Listen, Christians have no problem saying that if you don't accept Jesus as God, then you do not know God, right? If you don't believe Jesus is God, then you don't know God. But why isn't that the same when we talk about the Holy Spirit, right? You may as well blow up the Trinity 
perhaps not with words, but maybe just functionally. The other extreme is to take Pentecost and what Acts 2 says about the Holy Spirit and to make the Holy Spirit the only governor for the Christian faith, right? This extreme diminishes the role of the Father and the Son and places the Holy Spirit as like superior. Again, this results in an unorthodox view of the Trinity, and sometimes this leads to doctrines that present a heretical view of the Trinity. Listen, the Lord saved me through a Pentecostal church, right? I'm talking like people running around waving flags like crazy. I mean, what I would say now is like, whoa, that's not 1 Corinthians 14 order. They treated the Holy Spirit as like a genie in a lamp that granted Holy Spirit wishes, you know. I've seen the abuses located in each side of this ditch, right? We've got a ditch on each side, and we've got to stay out, stay out of those ditches, stay away from those ditches. So here's how we need to understand and apply the Holy Spirit in our lives from Acts 2. Let's realize that when Jesus passes the baton to the church, he is passing it along to you, Christian, which means the Holy Spirit is in you. We've talked about that. The moment you repented from your sin... And with faith, you put your trust in Christ, you were baptized with the Holy Spirit. God is in and with you, period. Please do not make any mistake about it. Do not question it. God seals his children by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.13. Here's what the Holy Spirit is currently doing. The Holy Spirit testifies in your life to the risen Christ. Every Christian has faith in Christ because the Holy Spirit revealed Christ to the heart. Also, the Holy Spirit empowers Christians. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is in every Christian. (laughs) Think about that. Next, the Holy Spirit also restores God's people, right? I mean, think about this for a moment. Before Christ, a Christian is broken, hurting, rebellious. After a person is saved, God the Holy Spirit takes the fragmented pieces of your life and just begins to put them back together. As each piece is put back into place by the Spirit, The beauty and truth of the gospel becomes more precious. Rebelling against God turns into worship. The Spirit continues to restore God's people until Jesus comes back to bring the ultimate restoration and redemption. The last point about what the Holy Spirit is doing is this. He is making us collectively one in Christ. He has made us collectively one in Christ. For a moment, consider the number of nations represented at Pentecost. This is the really cool point. Folks from all over could travel to Jerusalem this time of year because the conditions are favorable. This was a diverse group of people at Pentecost. Perithians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya and Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. I mean, we may as well say Americans, Canadians, Mexicans, Bolivians, Germans, Chinese, Ugandans, Russians, Britons, all these people from different nations, from different walks of life, speaking their own language, coming from their own culture, with varying skin colors. Guess what? We see at Pentecost, they're one in Christ. They're one in Christ. It's, it's truly remarkable. It's truly remarkable. Let me skip ahead here in my notes. It could be, it might be, that a bunch of country bumpkins from the backwoods hanging out in Jerusalem from all kinds of nations, came together, and God moved. And God moved. Verses 12 and 13 show us two ways in which the people responded at Pentecost. It shows us two ways that people in our generation continue to respond. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Right? Right? Why are all these people speaking in what we call tongues and languages? And... But others mock, say, saying, they are filled with new wine. Does Pentecost cause you to be in awe and wonder at the work and majesty of God? I hope so. 
does the miraculous cause you to pause and just praise God? I praise you, Lord, for what you've done. If so, your heart is in a great place. Your heart's in a great place. Embrace the mystery, and you will embrace the majesty of God. Perhaps you count yourself as the one who currently mocks and looks at Pentecost and say, y'all drunk. Right? That was one of the responses. It's 9 a.m. and you're already hitting the bottle. You were saying, there's no way this happened. Well, my response to you is, may God have mercy on your soul. May the Holy Spirit reveal to your heart the glories of Jesus Christ. May the Holy Spirit turn your skepticism into praise through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. In closing, it seems that one of the chief takeaways from Acts 2, verses 1 to 13, is the redemptive work of God, without a doubt. God has been and is always at work in his people. And now we, Redemption Hill Church, are on a mission for God while living in the reality of Pentecost. We benefit from all that happened at Pentecost. Pentecost put into motion an unstoppable and ever-advancing gospel mission through God's church. That's why we exist here in the Des Moines Metro. Because we're a part of God's mission to advance the gospel. We need to go out into the world and testify to the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. You're all here, if you're a Christian, you're here because God has changed your life. Now we need to go, we need to pivot and be like, let's go tell others. The harvest is plentiful. It is plentiful. Until Jesus comes back, that is our mentality. It is plentiful. And we are God's laborers. We go into the world persuading those who mock God and those who say uh, that people speaking in tongues at Pentecost were drunk on wine. We go to those people. We go to all of them. You, Christian, have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, say this lovingly, now act like it, right? Sean Powers needs to act like it. Live in the reality that God, the Holy Spirit, is in you and at work through you. Let me pray. You're listening to an audio resource from Redemption Hill Church. This resource is not meant to be a replacement for participation at a local church, but an accessory to the care you're receiving from your own pastors. To learn more about Redemption Hill Church or to give to our ministry, visit redemptionhilldsm.org.